Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. And then in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, says this, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. Father, thank you for your word. <clears throat> thank you, Lord, for the good thing you're going to do today. We ask you to have your way in this service and do what would be pleasing in your sight. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we bind every spirit of hell assigned against this service. Devils, you have no rights. You have no privileges. Jesus Christ is Lord over this service. Now come, Holy Spirit, and have your way. Everyone say, come, Holy Spirit. Have your way in this service. Come, Holy Spirit. Have your way in my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, before I start my message, I want to make an announcement about, I shared with you recently that I wanted to pray over people in debt. On January the 24th, I'm going to pray by the instruction of the Holy Spirit over every person that's in bondage to debt. Now, what I want you to do, and I believe the Holy Spirit has inspired me to say this, is I want you to bring a list of people you owe. You don't, you don't have to reveal it to anybody. You can wad it up in a, in a tight wad if you want to. But I want to lay hands on that and believe that the bondage of debt is going to be broken over your life. In Jesus' name. That's on January the 24th. So don't forget that. That'll give you two weeks to get prepared and come prepared for God to destroy the bondage of debt. Praise God. So bondage. Well, I've been te I started last time I taught, I was shared with you the vision that God gave me for the year 2010. In that vision, the Lord said, or what the Lord uh, inspired me with, is that he wanted us to double, that 2010 was going to be a year of doubling. And it's a scriptural principle we shared with you out of Matthew chapter 25, that God in the parable of the servants that uh, were given gifts and talents, that the one that had five talents, he doubled, made five talents more. The one that had two talents, he doubled, made two talents more. But the one that had one talent, the Bible says, went and hid his Lord's money. And when the Lord came for a reckoning, he had to say, well, I didn't do anything. I knew you were an austere man and you, uh, you know, you were going to be mad if, if I lost your money. So I went and hid your money. And now here, I'm going to give you back what you gave me. Well, those two servants that were faithful and doubled, the Lord said to both of them, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many. But the one that had one talent and hid his talent, the Lord said, okay, take the talent away from him and give it to the one that has ten. Yes. If you don't lose, if you don't use what God gives you, you lose it. That's a biblical principle. And the standard that God has set is to double. What God gives you, double it. And that way, then supernatural things begin to happen. And we don't operate in our own power. We operate in the power of the Holy Spirit. So in order to double, what God has to do for us is to get us out of our comfort zone. See, we have reached a place as a church where we're comfortable. We've got our bills paid. We don't owe anybody. We've got uh, enough people, you know, that we're paying our bills and we're enjoying our Christian life. But sometimes you have to be stirred by the Holy Spirit to press into more that God has for you. There's something God has for you that if you don't press into it, you won't get it. There's something God has for this church. If we don't press into it, we won't get it. We can just go through life comfortable, but God wants us to be more than comfortable. God wants us to make an impact on the world. 
And the same is true with all of you that are here this morning. God wants to do something supernatural. So we're going to use our faith, and we're going to believe God that we're going to double as a congregation, but that that doubling is going to be a principle that God wants all of us to get involved with. So we, we shared with you, if we do double, we won't have enough room in our present sanctuary to seat everybody. But God, I believe, gave a plan that we can build an all-purpose building where we would have a place that we could have a fellowship hall and we could use it for other things, for children's ministry, whatever else we wanted to use it for. And when we outgrow this sanctuary, we would be able to go into a temporary building that we could use as a sanctuary until we could build a new sanctuary. But if we double, we would... Uh, we would be able to get the money so we could pay cash for it rather than have to borrow. How many believe you ought to pay cash for what you do for God? So we're going to pay cash for it. So that's, that's the vision for this coming year. Now, we, we have uh, you know, over 225000 in the in the building fund, but that's not enough to build a new sanctuary. But it's a good start toward building an all-purpose building. So that's what we're going to do this next year with the help of the Holy Spirit. And with your help, we will do that. So praise God. Now, God wants his house full, the Bible says. And in order to get his house full, God has instructed us, the church, to go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. Now, compel means you put some effort into it, right? Yeah. So you have to put some effort into whatever it is that God wants you to do to reach other people. Now, this means that what we're facing is there's a lost world out there that do, they do not understand what you understand. They do not know what you know. They do not know how wonderful it is to be saved. They don't know what it is to have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And if you were to die, you'd go to heaven. They don't know what it means to live by the Word of God and understand that by the stripes of Jesus you were healed 2,000 years ago, that all of your needs are met according to His riches and glory. They don't understand that. And they're not listening to Christian Radio, they're not watching Christian television, and they don't want to come to church. They don't speak our language, and they would not be comfortable, they feel like. So what has to happen is Christian people have to go out where people know them, friends that they work with, people that they live around, and they have to begin to let people know we do not have horns. We do not... <laughs> We're just regular people. Sure, we're excited about God, and we love God, but why don't you come to church and visit our church? Or let me tell you what God did for me. You know, there's some way that God wants us to witness to people so that we can have them come to church. Now, it's a proven fact that over, I think it's 95% of people that come to church, come to church because someone invited them to come to church. They don't just wake up one morning and decide, this is my day to go to church. They go to church because someone invited them and made it easy for them to come and spent some time talking with them. Now, I don't know if you remember when you got saved. But I can remember when I got saved in 1963 at the East Gadsden Methodist Church. When I got saved, I wanted to talk to somebody. Has anybody uh, felt that way when you got saved? You just wanted to talk to somebody. You wanted to know if anybody else went through what you're going through. If anybody else is as excited about God as you are. I mean, when I got saved, my life changed. Now, when my life changed, I've got a testimony. Other people want to know, what happened to you when you got saved? Did, did your life change? What, what has God done for you? Now, a problem we face 
is that it's not natural to compel people to come to church. It's not even natural to want to, t want to invite people. See, human beings are peculiar people. If you put a church full of people together, you may have one in the bunch that loves to go out and witness and talk to people about Jesus. But that means the rest of the bunch don't want to do it. <laughs> they don't want to do it. They just don't want to do it. So what we have to do is overcome that fear and, you know, we come up with, with nice sounding phrases like, well, you know, my spiritual life is private. <laughs> and I just don't want to go around and talk about something so private as me getting saved or, you know, having the Lord in my heart. That's private to me. Well, it is private to you, but God says there's a whole world out there dying and going to hell, and I need somebody to go out there and be a witness to these people. So therefore, the Lord said, shared, basically out in the text scripture that I read to you, which is commonly known as the Great Commission, the Lord said, now, here's the deal. All power, just, this is Jesus talking. He said, all power in heaven and in earth has been given unto me. But I'm going to give you this power so that you can go out there where lost people are in all the world and witness for me. And then he said, and you know, after the resurrection, he, he made this wonderful statement that we shared with you last time in Acts chapter 1 8. Jesus said, You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Now listen to this. And you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem in Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Jesus said, you shall be witnesses unto me. Jesus said in the Great Commission, I've got the power, but I'm giving it to you. Now you go into all the world and preach the gospel. Now where is your world? Well, in the scripture in Acts 1-8, you start where you live, in Jerusalem. And then when you start in Jerusalem, it'll spread out to Judea, and then it'll bloom over to Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. So that's the plan that God has to reach the world. Now, what we have to understand is this is not a suggestion. It's a mandate. And it's not anything you want to do. You have to let the Holy Spirit of God rise up and live big on the inside of you to give you wisdom in how your life can touch another life. Because people are not listening to what you're saying as much as they're watching the way you're living. And so when you're living the Christian life, your life will touch other people and you'll have an opportunity to share with them, you know, what God has done in your life. Now, every person in this building, if you're born again, you've got a testimony. Your life changed when you got saved. You're not the same old reprobate you were before you got saved. God did something in your heart. You're different now than you used to be. And God has really done something for you. And so you're not hopeless anymore. You don't face life the way you faced life before you got saved. You don't have to worry over things you used to worry about because now you know a living God that is alive and he's wanting to move in supernatural ways and therefore you have a testimony to lost people that will help them and encourage them. Now if we don't reach these people, they're doomed. Now, hell is an awful place, and we don't want anyone to go to hell. God does not want anyone to go to hell. God does not send people to hell. You know, people say, uh, all the time people are saying, well, you know, God wouldn't send that person to hell. They're, they're, God's not that kind of God. God does not send people to hell. 
We got sold into hell through Adam's transgression. When he sinned, he sold the human race into hell. Jesus came to redeem us from hell. And thank God he shed his blood and paid the price for mankind to go to heaven. Praise God. He paid the price for all of mankind to be saved. So Christians have a responsibility. Aren't you glad somebody talked to you? Aren't you glad someone invited you to church? Aren't you glad that, that uh, when, some, when you heard the good news, you didn't, you didn't just run away from it, you embraced it? Now this is what God wants out of us as Christians. See, it's not the will of God for Christians to cluster together in Christian huddles and bless one another. Well, I hate to burst your bubble. See, I, I've, I've had, as a pastor, I've had people say to me, Brother Gene, pray for me. I work with all these sinners. They curse. They tell dirty jokes. They blaspheme God. And I'm, I, I don't want to work with them. Would you pray and let me get the job with some Christian people somewhere? Because this is just an awful place to work. No. I won't pray for you because God wants Christians right in the middle of cussing people, right in the middle of blaspheming people, right in the middle of lost people. God wants a Christian there because we're the light of the world. We're the salt of the earth. We're not here to bless one another. Our purpose for being is to face the harsh realities of the world and understand that God has given us power to go into the world but not be a part of the world and we can escape all of the evil that the devil's trying to throw at us because God has made us us able ministers of the New Testament and we're going to touch somebody's life and they're going to come to God because we're here. See, that's our purpose. If all God wanted out of us is to go to heaven, the kindest thing God could do is let you get saved and drop dead because then you miss all this tribulation down here on the world. And then you go to heaven. Heaven is a wonderful place. Heaven is a better place than earth. But see, the purpose of God is not to get the Christians to heaven. The purpose of God is to get Christians in the world where lost people are so that we can be a witness right in the middle of sin. That's our job. Now, sometimes we act as if God does not like the world. But God likes the world. The Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world might be saved. This is why Jesus came. He came to save the world. And so that's, what we have to understand as Christians. See, this didn't say for God so loved the Christians or God so loved the white person or the black person or God so loved the rich person or the poor person. No, God so loved the world. Thank God I'm part of the world. Are you part of the world? Well, God wants you to know that your neighbor is part of the world. He wants you to know that that person you work with is part of the world. He wants you to know that that ugly acting person is part of the world. And God loves ugly acting people. He doesn't love their ugly acts, but he loves ugly acting sinning people. And he wants all the world to be saved. Now, in John chapter 17, Jesus is praying an intercessory prayer. Now, this is before the Great Commission, but he's praying this prayer. Now, listen to what he said in John chapter 17, verse 14. Jesus is praying to the Father, and he said, he said, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them because they're not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. 
You're not of the world. Your citizenship is heaven. You're, we're sojourners through the world, but we're not part of the world. Now listen to verse 15. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Did you hear that? Jesus, Jesus is praying. How many of you believe Jesus gets his prayers answered? Jesus is praying, and he said, Father, I do not want you to take them out of the world. I know they want to get out. I know they don't like it down here. But I don't want you to take them out of the world. But I want you to keep them from the evil that's in the world. And then he said this. Sanctify them through thy truth. Sanctified means set them apart. Keep them separate. Don't let the evil hurt them. Separate them from the evil. Now listen to how he's going to do that. Through thy truth, thy word is truth. Hey, see why we preach the word of God? See why the word of God is so important? It sanctifies you from the evil that's in the world. It lets you live on a higher plane than you can naturally live on because you're living by the word of God. Verse 18 says, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them. Now, now the them is you. He sent you into the world. Verse 19 says, And for their sakes I sanctified myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth, through the Bible, through the word. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Jesus, praying to the Father, said, the world is going to see my people start coming together, working together, loving one another, and sharing with other people. And the world, just by the act of the church, being the church, will start believing. Well, praise God. Don't you think it's time we've started being the church? Verse 22 says, And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and has loved them as thou hast loved me. In other words, we've got to let the world know that Jesus loves lost people just like he loves saved people. And he wants every person to come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So even as he was facing Calvary, his thought was on the world. I've got to get the world saved. How are we going to do that? And that was, that was the process that led up to the Great Commission. See, he, he acknowledges that the world is not a nice place to, to be. It's a hostile environment. It's under a devilish rule. The Bible says the God of this world, which is the devil, rules over this world by the law of sin and death. But Jesus defeated the devil and then gave the authority of the earth to the church so that now the church can go into the world and we can tread on serpents and scorpions and over all powers of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt us. See, this is something that God has done to help us win the world. So Jesus said, I'm going to sanctify them with my word. And this means we're going to be set apart. We're going to be kept from evil. The, the evil in this world is not going to have to come on us. And it also means that we're going to be able to give a testimony that God has made us an overcomer. And God has given us the ability to live in the world when everything around us seems to be falling apart and it does not come near us. See, we've been sanctified from the evil that's in the world. We've been set apart. And the world then is going to know there's something different about the church because we're living like the church. Don't you know, when the world sees the church living overcomingly in this world 
when the world starts seeing the church staying well when everybody else is getting sick, when the world starts seeing the church paying their bills when everybody else is going broke, they'll say there's something about this church. What's going on with this group of people? And they want to know what's going on. There has to be somebody that can share, well, this is just what God promised. He said this would happen. In our text scripture, we find that God's attitude is not changed. He's still after the world. He's still wanting the world to be saved. The church was never intended by God to be an island separated from the world. A sad commentary on the church and on Christians is we expend all of our energy and effort and money on the church and leave the world to go to hell. That's a sad commentary because this is not what God intended the church to be. In Acts 26, verse 26, it says this. This is a powerful scripture. I hope, you don't, I hope this doesn't just flit over your head. Listen to it. Acts 26, 26. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom I also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things which are hidden from him, that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. In the early church, the early Christians made such an impact on the world that everybody had to know something was going on. It was not done in the corner. Now, that brings me to what I want to share with you as we get into this year. How can we effectively reach lost people? See, all of us in this building have a multitude of obligations. All of us fathers have responsibilities. All of you mothers have responsibilities. All of us that, uh, you know, have a job, we have responsibilities. But what God wants us to know is we are not to hide behind our responsibilities just because they may seem overwhelming. We're not to run behind our responsibilities and say, well, I wish I had time, but I just don't. I wish I could do something, but I just can't. Look at all I've got to do. I've got a wife to take care of. I've got a, I've bought a field. I've got me some oxen, you know, all these other things. There's never an acceptable excuse with God for not putting him first. Because he said, made this promise to us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now listen to this. And all of these things will be added unto you. Now what are the, all the things? Well, you go back to Matthew chapter 6, and you would find out that all things are all things that you need to live an abundant, overcoming, victorious Christian life down here on this earth. It's what you need to, uh, in other words, the Lord said, now I know you have needs down here on the earth. I know you have responsibilities. I know you've got to educate your children. I know you need a car to drive. I know you need a house to live in. I know you need groceries to put on the table. I understand all that. But he said, now I know there's also, there is also the possibility that you would give your life for things. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. If you'll just put me first, I'll give you things. See, that's his promise. So what we have to do is live like that's true. So we cannot hide behind our responsibilities and say, well, I've just got so much to do. I don't have any time. I don't have time to witness. I don't have time to talk to other people. I don't have time to read my Bible. I don't have time to pray. But we do have time. And he will make up the difference yes, he will. in the time we need to do the other things right. if we'll put him first. See, he said in Acts 1, 8, but you shall receive power <clears throat> after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witness unto me 
in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the other most parts of the earth. Now, if you take that and break it down, it lets you know how simple being a witness is. This is the simplicity of it. Each believer <clears throat> is to be personally endued with power from on high. Then this person endued with power from on high is to witness to another person who is lost and doesn't know God. And this person is to be endued with power on high. And then this person is to go to the next person and witness to what happened to him. Now, when you do that, this is God's plan to reach the world because you start doubling. See, every time you witness to somebody else, the possibility of doubling is there because one other person, and then that one other person witnesses and they double. Now, doubling is, creates what in mathematics we call an exponential curve. Doubling starts out, an exponential curve starts out kind of flat, and it grows up just gradually over a period of time, and then all of a sudden it goes zoop. That's what an exponential curve is. Well, let's, uh, let me give you an example of an exponential curve. Let's suppose we put on a graph. Let, I don't know how many Christians there are in the world. I didn't look this up. But let's, let's imagine that there are 20 million Christians in the world that are active on fire Christians. 20, many, 20 million. And probably that's a conservative estimate. Well, if all 20 million witnessed and got another person saved, the next year there'd be 40 million Christians. Within nine years, there would be five billion and 120 million Christians. I think that's about the, in five billion, the population of the world, something like that. Something like five billion is the population of the world. Less nine years, you could win the world for Jesus Christ. Now, we have come up as the church, we have come up with all kind of plans <laughs> to reach the world. And we've fallen short. But if we would go back to the gospel plan that Jesus instigated, it wouldn't take long that we could really make an impact on the world. In fact, this, uh, this, this was the plan that was instigated on the day of Pentecost. Yeah. And from that time on, that little group of people, 120 people in an upper room, baptized in the Holy Spirit, came out the first day and 3,000 people right. were born again, yeah. brought into the kingdom of God. And within a short period of time, less than... 200 years, the whole known world was evangelized in just a short period of time. Now, you do not know, after the, after the first apostles died, we do not, from the top of our head, you cannot name one other famous Christian during that time that helped evangelize the world. Because God does not look for stars. God looks for people that can do his work. Amen. And this is what we have to understand. This means that every Christian is a witness. Every Christian has a responsibility. Now, there is no such thing in the, in the Bible, in Scripture as active Christians and inactive Christians. That's why we don't have inactive members on our church roll. If you're inactive, you're not a church member. So there's, there's nothing, nothing in the Bible about 
active Christians and inactive Christians. Now, I know this will kind of blow some of you away. There's not even anything in the Bible that really separates clergy from lay people. See, we're the ones that put all these, uh, you know, separations. Actually, the only difference between a, a pastor and you is calling. I'm called to pastor, but if you're a child of God, you're called to do something. You may not be called a, a pulpit ministry, but you're called to be a witness. You're called to touch somebody for the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's a job for all of us to do. There's something that we need to do to touch the lives of other people. Now, every one of you come in contact with people on a regular basis that God wants you to touch. Now, in the Bible, witnessing was not something that you did on Thursday. <laughs> Thursday night, get a witnessing group together. And let's go out and witness. Everybody was a witness. Everybody saw it as a lifestyle. It was not something that we put on once or twice a week or, you know, in the spring when maybe we're going to have a spring revival and reach some lost people. And we have, you know, kind of like an Indian raid. We're going to go in there and get them, and then we'll be through. No, you're not through. You're never going to be through. As long as you breathe, you're a witness. As long as breath is in your body, you're a witness, and you're to be at work doing the work of the gospel. The early church put this plan to work, and it produced amazing results. Simple people who were not necessarily educated, they were not clergy, they were just regular, everyday people, changed the world through witnessing. And in Acts chapter 17, verse 6, it says this. This is another one of those good scriptures. Acts 17, verse 6. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down have come hither also. <laughs> I tell you, I'd like that to be a testimony about our church. Oh, those believing people that turned Momar Road upside down. <laughs> They're down in downtown Atlanta. What are we going to do? Well, see, they touch lives. They change lives. And that's the responsibility that we have as Christians. The evangelization of the early church was not brilliantly trained, educated, well-scripted people. It was just regular, everyday, ordinary people that go to work, go fishing, do whatever has to be done to make a living. But everywhere they went, they saw it was an opportunity to touch somebody. And so they began to touch lives everywhere that they went. And because they touch lives, the gospel spread to all the world, all the known world, in just a short period of time. Now, if they can evangelize the world with just 120 and take them less than 200 years to do it, it looks like with 20 million or more, that's a very conservative estimate. We would probably, if we, in truth known, we probably got several hundred million Christians around the world. We ought to be able to make an effort. We ought to be able to touch somebody and make some changes in the world. I guarantee you if the, if the church ever became the church, we could change society. We wouldn't be going through some of the things we're going through today if we, just, if we were just the church. Because the church can change the world. And the thing that happened is they kept the chain going. They were compelled to witness. You shall be witnesses unto me. Now when the chain breaks down, 
That's where the program falls apart. And then we say, well, now we've got evangelists and we've got, we've got these great TV evangelists and we've got all this and that's the way we'll win some people. But, you know, we're just too, too, as a ordinary people. God doesn't want to mess around with these ordinary little people like us. So we'll let some of the biggies do it. No, that's where it breaks down. The biggies aren't going to do it. It's the little people like us that get out there and let God use us to touch somebody's life. Now, through the years, the church has lost sight of this simple method. And what we've done is we've made evangelism something that has to be complicated. And it has to be well organized and well planned. No, all it needs is for every Christian to wake up to the fact when I got saved, it changed my life. And there's somebody else that I can touch and it'll change their life. That's evangelism. And you say, well, I don't know what scriptures to use. Well, you know, it takes a while to get familiar with the Bible so you can use the right scriptures. But it takes very little effort to share with somebody, what did God do for you? What did God do for me? So you can share what God did out of your heart. Did God change your life? You know, I, sometimes I, I see Christians and they don't act like God changed their life. <laughs> But when I got saved, God absolutely changed my life. It was like I was going this way, and bang, I'm going this way. Well, that's what conversion is. Conversion is a change of mind, a change of, uh, you know, you're going the wrong way. You're going the world way. You meet Jesus Christ, and you decide, I'm going to go God's way. And it revolutionizes your life absolutely revolutionizes your life and you're never the same again absolutely. and as long as you keep that as uh, foremost then you're going to be able to witness to other people because you've got you've got a story you've got a witness now nothing's wrong with anything you do to win people any plan you have any evangelistic plan that you have there's nothing wrong with it but it's important that every Christian becomes an effective witness. It's important for all of us to have a testimony. Every Christian life can influence another life because we touch other people. Now, here's a, two things that happen when you reach another person. Number one, you bring a new baby into the family of God. And... That new life creates excitement in the family. Have you ever been in a hospital room when a new baby has come around and everybody is laughing and having a party and look at this baby and oh, isn't this wonderful? Oh, uh, any of you seen Angela Newton lately? I mean, she... <laughs> She acts like a, a drunk person in a daze. Oh, 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 see this baby. Oh, 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 oh tears running down her cheek. Oh, this is so wonderful. Oh, I'm telling you, it brings excitement. And not only do you have the excitement, but now you got a, a new baby. Now, any of you parents know what happens when you get new babies? <laughs> you do get out of your rut. But babies are messy. They have to be cleaned up after. So you don't bring a new baby in and expect them to first week brush their teeth and make the bed. They have to be trained. Now this is what the church is all about. The church is the house where we grow up. God gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints so the saints could do the work of the ministry. That's what the 
church is all about. And since we're the salt of the earth, we could look at it this way. We are the salt shaker. <laughs> so we come here, and now we got all you little salt pebbles out there, and you're just as salty as you can be. And we put some salt on you to make you more salty, and we, we help with the saltiness. But when you leave here, you sprinkle on other things and make other things salty. You know what salt does? It makes people thirsty. And so you make people thirsty. They look at you and they say, man, I'm thirsty for that. It also preserves. It, it, it keeps corruption back. I mean, there's just wonderful things about being the salt of the earth. And so uh, what I'm trying to do is to shake you up good. You know, I'm going to shake you up and spew you out there so that you touch somebody else's life. And somebody's going to be changed because you came along. As God's people, we're salt. We represent that. The church here is the salt shaker, but you're the salt. So we have to come to this truth. The whole church, the entire church, every member of the church, women members, men members, teenage members of the church are to touch other people as witnesses. That's our responsibility. The responsibility of every Christian here this morning. And as we said previously, that being a witness for Christ is not natural. It has to be worked at. We have to do something. See, I've known hundreds of Christians in my lifetime. And out of all the Christians that I've ever known, very few were natural witnesses. That means it just doesn't come natural. You, you, you're kind of repelled by it. The fact that I'm going to have to talk to somebody about God. But the truth is, you've been empowered with Holy Ghost power to be a witness. So you don't have to be afraid. You can be natural. You can just naturally meet people, talk to people. And you don't have to worry about what you're going to say. Uh, you know, just start talking to people. Most people want to be loved, want to be uh, cared for, want somebody, uh, they just want somebody to think well of them, to do something for them, to be a, a, a just a caregiver of sorts so that we can be lights in the darkness. And that's what life is all about as a Christian. So that's, that's the first step in us being witnesses that I've shared with you this morning. Now what I want to do is I want to pray for you and release you in faith and release that Holy Spirit anointing that's in you to stir a little bit so that you can begin to touch lives. So I want you to stand up and just lay hands on yourself if you would and say this. All right, say this like you mean it now. So repeat after me. Dear Heavenly Father, Dear Heavenly Father thank, you your word. thank you for your word. I do believe your word. I believe your word. And therefore I believe, therefore I believe. I'm, called of God I'm called of God to be a witness. Be a witness. Thank, God thank God I don't have to do it in my own power. I do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit. So Dear Heavenly Father, so I make a commitment with the help of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to be a witness. I'm going to touch other people with the love of God, with the power of the Holy Spirit, and lives will be changed. And I say, I'm going to double. I'm going to touch somebody and change their life by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank God. I don't have to do it in my own power. I do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that, Father. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Thank you for that, Father. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Father. Praise God. Hallelujah. Uh, it's, it's like throwing somebody a, a life boy that's struggling in life. They're drowning. They don't know what to do. They don't know which way to turn. And you can throw them just a life boy. And they can grab hold of it. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. I tell you, when you're out there in the world and you don't know God, you're like, you're like in an ocean. You're like drowning any minute. You don't know which way to turn. But thank God there's safety in Jesus Christ. And he wants to rescue all of those that are lost, all of those that are drowning. And we give you praise for that, Father, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, I want to take authority over. There's a bug going around. A lot of people are fighting a bug right now, some kind of virus. I don't know what it is, but it needs to be stopped. So, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I bind this foul work of the Spirit that's come against the people of God. This, whatever's causing them to be nauseated and diarrhea, we bind that in Jesus' name. I take authority over you, devil. You're trespassing on God's people. I resist you in Jesus' name. I command your hold to be broken in the name of Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Everybody say, thank God. I'm well. Thank God. I'm well. I'm, well. I'm going to stay well, stay well. Because, of because of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give God praise for that. Hallelujah. <laughs> praise God. Praise God. I tell you, when June was going through her bout with vertigo, she said this, and I thought this is the way we ought to all feel. She says, I hate sickness. I hate it. <laughs> Praise God. We ought to all hate sickness. It's a, it's a work of the devil. Hallelujah. The Bible says, submit yourself to God. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. So we resist sickness. We resist it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now let me, uh, let me have you bow your head just a minute. I don't know who's here this morning. Don't know everyone here. But let me ask this question. You're here this morning. You'd say, Brother Gene, I don't know if I'm saved or not. I'd like to leave here convinced that I'm a child of God, that I'm born again, that I, my name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and that I'm saved. If that's you, uh, wave at me and I'm going to pray for you. Anybody in here, you don't know if you're saved or not, but you'd like to know? Praise God. All right, I'm assuming everybody's saved. Well, let's, let's, let's make this confession then. Thank God, Thank God. I'm, saved. I'm saved. Jesus Christ is my Lord. Jesus Christ is my Lord. And I do believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. And that he's in heaven as my Lord and Savior. And Father, I forgive anyone that's ever wronged me. And I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. Cleanse me and make me righteous. Thank God I'm saved. Thank God I'm saved. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm saved.